Recently, industry giants Nike, Costco, and Micron reported quarterly earnings. We spoke to several experts and analysts who broke down what the numbers are and what they mean for investors. Costco just out a little while ago, beating estimates on the top and bottom line. Comparable sales, excluding fuel, rising 3.8% in the fourth quarter um, in the U.S. Here to break down the latest in the retail space, we have CFRA analyst Arun Sundaram. Arun, um, when we look at these Costco numbers, kind of what do you make of it writ large? It looks like some of these comp sales in particular came in below average analyst estimates. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, on the top line, there usually aren't uh, many surprises there because Costco, they they release monthly sales figures. So investors kind of have a sense of where the top line will will land. Um, you know, what what's a little more unknown is on on margins or profitability. Um, but I think there were some positives and negatives in terms of margins. Uh, gross margins did did increase about you know 40 to 50 basis points year over year, uh, which is a big positive. I think that shows that freight and transportation costs have come down and also uh, merchandise costs are, aren't going up as much as they used to. Uh, but on the other side, uh, it looks like wage inflation seems to be a, a continued issue. Uh, and, and that will likely continue uh, next fiscal year uh, is, the, is the wage pressures that is going to impact Costco as well as the rest of retail. And Arun, I know uh, some analysts on the street are waiting for this membership fee hike. They'll point out, listen, we haven't seen one since 2017. Are you expecting that? If you are, Arun, when do you think that could come and how much of a hike would you be expecting? Yeah, so yeah, we no, we've been we've been anticipating one for a while now. It's, it's kind of been, kept, it keeps getting pushed out a little bit you know, further and further. Uh, Costco said it's just a matter of of uh, when, not if, they'll raise membership fees. And, and they're really waiting for inflation to moderate before they, they decide to raise fees. Uh, but now we are starting to see inflation moderate, especially in, in, in food and, and consumables. Uh, inflation is coming down. And uh, so I think we could see a membership fee increase announced by the end of this year. Uh, you know, Costco does have the power to do so. It's, if you look at their renewal rates in the US and Canada, renewal rates are around 93%. And then worldwide, Costco's renewal rates are around 90%. So tremendous customer member loyalty uh, there. And, and so when, when they do raise fees, uh, it will likely be uh, about uh, 5 to $10 uh, consistent with historical standards. Uh, that's probably going to be the case. Arun, do you think in some ways Costco is a victim of its own success? I mean, has had sort of consistent performance here. Um, the shares were up a little more than 20% year to date. And then if you look at sort of a small miss on comp sales, getting punished a little bit in um, after hours trading, is that sort of the perspective that investors should be bringing to this? Yeah, no, I think you, I think you framed that uh, perfectly. You know, it's Costco over the past three years, really since the pandemic began, Costco's used to generating, you know, double digit comp sales growth. Uh, and now, you know, things are just normalizing. So. Uh, comp sales are are moderating. We, we've we've gone from that double digit comp sales percentage now to mid single digit. It'll likely be low single digit uh, their their next fiscal year, uh, and and once that happens, there could be some margin pressure because when you're not growing the top line as much, it's hard to absorb some of those fixed costs. Uh, so this this past fiscal year, you know, comp sales grew 5.2 percent. Uh, that's actually the lowest uh, uh, growth rate since 2017. So investors are not really used to experiencing you know, mid single digit comp sales growth for Costco, whereas compared to the rest of retail, you know, if other big box retailers, you know, had 5.2% comp sales growth, that'd be a tremendous year. But for Costco, its standards are a little bit higher. And Arun, um, bottom line, you know, you have a hold on the name, so you're on the sidelines. What would it take, Arun, for you to move to a buy on Costco? What do you need to see? Yeah, I mean, the real reason for our for our hold rating is is on valuation. You know, if you look at Costco shares, it trades at a forward PE of about 35 times, uh, making it one of the most expensive names in our in our retail coverage. Uh, versus, you know, other big box retailers trade at a much lower valuation. Walmart, for example, is around 23, 24 times. Target, you know, which is which has their own problems, is is around you know 13, 14 times of a forward PE. Uh, so we really think, you know, uh, the valuation is a little bit concerning. So we wait for a pullback on the shares before, um, you know, deciding whether we want to uh, upgrade our call or not. Let's talk Costco. Costco shares extending their losses in pre-market trading after the company reported its fourth fiscal quarter earnings Tuesday after the bell. The wholesale retailer beat analyst expectations on its top and bottom line, and comparable sales held steady even as gas prices surged. Investors, however, don't seem too pleased. Joining us now to break down why is Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma. Hey, Brooke. 
Good morning, Brad. That's right. Costco beat on both the top and bottom line, but clearly Wall Street a bit spooked here at some of the key points that were mentioned in the call. Those three points include, let's kick it off with that same source sales myths. Same source sales came in slightly higher than anticipated, up 1.1% compared to the estimates of 1.87%. Now, excluding gas and foreign exchange, sales jumped 3.8%. That also was slightly below expectations for of 3.92%. Now, what drove that same source sales miss is the average ticket is still down 3.9% worldwide. And here in the U.S., that average ticket is down 4.5% from a year ago. Now, what we're seeing that's driving that ticket lower is weakness and bigger ticket discretionary items still holding on, as well as gas price deflation. J.P. Morgan out with note this morning, emphasizing that ticket growth has not been positive for Costco since 2022. And moving right along, those higher wage expenses, Citi saying in a note today that Costco is still committed to investing in associate wages and made an unplanned investment in starting salaries for some new employees this week, which is off their typical cadence of every March. Now, when asked on the call of how exactly wages compare to its competition, when you think about Walmart that recently announced a change in their wage approach. The Costco said that ultimately the pressure comes from ourselves. They said that they provide the best hourly wage packet out there, a package out there with wages, benefits, and contributions. They also noted that their average U.S. employee makes about $26 an hour in the high 25s, and that's on top of what they say is a very rich health plan. And once again, you know, what we've all been waiting to hear on both Main Street and Wall Street is will they raise those membership fees? Well, not yet. Membership fees is a key revenue stream for the wholesale retailer. We saw it come in at $1.51 billion, higher than Wall Street expectations of $1.46 billion. Paying household members is also up 7.9%. But on the call, CFO Richard Galanti saying, quote, it's a question of when, not if. You'll see it happen at some point. We can't really tell you if it's in our plans or not. We feel good, say, about all the attributions of member loyalty and member growth. And yesterday afternoon, following the results, Yahoo Finance spoke to a CFRA analyst. He said that he expects Costco to raise membership fees by the end of this year. He expects that range will be about a 5 to $10 jump in what they currently have in both Costco Gold Star membership, which is now at $60 per year, and executive membership, which now sits at $120 per year. So not if. But when will he watching Nike out with its first quarter results? And if you look at the earnings per share number coming in at 94 cents, that is versus the 75 cents that analysts had been estimating from the company. Um, revenue in the fourth quarter up 5 percent to 12.8 billion dollars. Uh, that's if you uh, don't look at a currency neutral up 8 percent on a currency neutral basis here. And so that means revenue overall at $12.94 billion is basically in line with estimates, maybe a slightly shy of estimates here. Greater greater China revenue on which there was a lot of attention, $1.74 billion short of the $1.83 billion that analysts had been anticipating here. Gross margin, 44.2%, which is a bit better than estimates, although it is down year over year, uh, down by 140 basis points here. So some interesting stuff uh, in these numbers, uh, Josh, as we look at them, a lot of attention on that China number, a lot of attention on inventories, a lot of attention on wholesale numbers as well. Yeah. So the stock is popping about 1.6%. So at least initially here in the afternoon, of course, as we were talking about, it had gotten so beat down, Julie, heading into the print. Um, I am very interested in China. I think that's, listen, that's a big market for Nike. Where's the business now and where is it's headed? We know China's economy is weak. It's sputtering. I think this is a great read, perhaps, on the Chinese consumer. There is competition in that market, too, not just, you know, the, the domestic brands, the home team, but also big brands like Lululemon have moved in. So very interesting to talk about China and the cross currents there. Yeah, just to break down those China numbers a little bit more, I'm looking at the X uh, currency changes year over year in those uh, revenues in China. Footwear. Uh, revenue up 22 percent. Again, X, uh, the effects of currency. Apparel up 36 percent. Equipment, it looks like, up 19 percent there in China for that number. Now, I was mentioning the wholesale numbers, which I want to highlight as well, because this Nike has sort of 
went all in on a direct-to-consumer right. strategy over the past few years and then backpedaled on that a little bit um, and is still doing a lot of sell-through through places like Foot Locker, which we've heard some sort of not-so-great signals from as of late. Wholesale reported revenues, uh, $6.7 billion in the fourth quarter. That's down 2% uh, uh, on a, including currency, up 2% on a currency neutral basis. So, you know, not seeing amazing wholesale numbers there. Inventory about flat year over year um, and a little bit lower than what analysts have been anticipating. So that actually might be a little bit of a positive number. You know, it was interesting, I mean, heading into this print, there were analysts who were taking down their ratings because they were worried about the consumer, the storm clouds that were brewing. And their, fa their idea was, listen, to the extent that consumers start getting a little nervous, probably footwear apparel would be the first things they cut. Right, but will it be Nike footwear and apparel, right? Yeah. Is, does it have such a cachet it's a strong that it is brand. more resistant? On the other hand, not cheap, Julie. Not cheap, not cheap. No. that's true. Although there's a big range of prices for uh, Nike merchandise, it is true. So let's get more on all of this here. Again, Nike earnings per share beating um, even as revenue sort of coming in, in line, just like light of estimates. David Swartz is joining us now, Morningstar Equity Analyst. Um, so, David, first of all, just give us like your big picture impression here of this Nike report. Looks like the sales are pretty much as expected. Uh, came in a little bit less than, than expected, but 2% growth is pretty close to what I had. I think I was at 2.2%. Uh, it looks like that by region, uh, the greater China sales were a little bit higher than I expected, up 5%. My estimate was up 2%. Uh, looks like North America was soft, but that's not a big surprise uh, because we have seen a lot of uh, slowness in, in apparel sales in, in North America, especially in department stores recently. And it looks like, again, the, uh, the standout uh, region for Nike was EMEA, uh, up 8%. That was higher than I expected. And uh, that region has really done well for a lot of multinationals, uh, much better than expected, uh, given that we have the uh, war in Ukraine and other issues. Um, so all in all, the sales look, look pretty good. Uh, margins look a little bit better than expected. Gross margin looks like it's about 50 basis points above my expectation. Now, Nike has a history of consistently beating margin expectations. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's a little bit of sandbagging uh, that, that Nike tends to bring down expectations to make it easier to beat them. And David, I, I want to get your take on something I was just talking to, to Julie about, which is some of your colleagues on, on the street, they were taking down their ratings heading into this report. And one big reason was they were clearly just feeling a little bit more nervous about the consumer dealing with different challenges. We know rising energy prices, hiring borrowing costs, David, the, the resumption of federal student loan payments. And the thinking was, well, if people are going to cut anything, immediately could be the new footwear and clothing. I just want to get your take on how you're thinking about that potential headwind, not, not just in this report, but looking ahead for Nike. Well, Nike, of course, has the advantage that it's a global business. So some of those factors that you mentioned would really apply to the United States maybe the US and Canada too, but wouldn't necessarily apply to all the regions where Nike sells its products. Uh, you know, so there's been also a lot of concern about the rate of the economic uh, recovery in China uh, from the COVID restrictions last year. And it has been kind of slow and the economic data from China has been kind of poor, but it seems like Nike has come back a little bit quicker than people expected in China. And in North America, you know, I think expectations, as I mentioned, were low to begin with. Um, so, you know, I think people understand that there are reasons to be concerned. And we certainly heard this from a lot of other apparel companies in North America that demand right now is not that strong. We have seen a shift away from buying apparel and footwear towards other things like travel. Um, and we have the uh, loan repayments coming up soon. You know, maybe that's a little bit exaggerated because it's not the first time that people have had to make payments on their student debt. Uh, you know, so people are kind of acting like it's never happened before, but of course it has. Um, so, you know, I think that Nike has shown that its brand is very strong and that its pricing is strong and that demand can overcome some of the macroeconomic factors that may be hurting a lot of other apparel producers. Um, I'm also curious about this strategy that we talked about, this sort of balance between direct to consumer and wholesale channels. Do you think that they have that cor that balance correct at this point? I think it's something that Nike is still working on. We have seen this year that Nike has reversed itself with a couple of retailers, um, including Macy's and DSW that it had, it had uh, in the past 
it pulled out of those retailers. And now it's going back in, apparently because Nike decided that it lost too many customers uh, by cutting them out of their wholesale partnership um, uh, list. So, you know, I think that Nike is still working on getting the right balance. There's a lot of debate among investors as to whether Nike's move towards direct to consumer will be margin accretive in the long term. Nike certainly says that it will be, and I tend to believe that it will be, and that's what I model. But it could prove to be a little bit more difficult than Nike expects uh, because there is a lot of extra cost also in, in running a direct to consumer business. And David, let me ask you about China as well. Obviously, a very important market for, China, for for Nike, but you look at that economy right now, it is weak. There's competition, not just from domestic brands, but of course, in the likes of Lululemon. Talk to me about how you see that opportunity for Nike in China. The opportunity is still huge. I mean, given that China's population is triple, more than triple, quadruple the United States, um, and it's spending on uh, per capita on athletic equipment and apparel and footwear is a fraction of what it is in the United States. So someday the Chinese market could be much larger uh, than the U.S. market. Right now it's already the, the second largest in the, in the world. Um, so, you know, it is a very important market for Nike. Nike certainly does have a lot of competition here, but it has less competition than it does in the United States. Um, Nike has thousands of stores in China and it has number one market share. Now, as you, as you referenced, Nike has um, struggled a bit with competition from the native Chinese brands, uh, Li Ning and Anta especially, uh, that have done pretty well in the last few years. Uh, they benefited from some political issues in China, as well as perhaps uh, their own products and um, the COVID issues in China too. Um, so we have seen bit of, a bit of a change in the market over the last few years, but I think Nike is coming back pretty well. It's certainly coming back better than Adidas. Uh, Adidas has reported just horrible numbers in China, and I think Nike is coming back stronger than they are. All right, Nike right now in the after hours, at least initially, investors like what they see, stocks pop at about 2%. David Swartz, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Micron technology, they are sinking in pre-market trading. Investors were hoping for Micron's earnings to rescue the tech sector and other stocks from that September slump. But the chip maker's weak financial results only added to the pressure here. The disappointing news came the day after the S&P 500 tech sector officially hit correction territory, falling 10% from recent highs. The sell-off fueled by the Fed's hawkish tone and fear of higher for longer interest rates. Now joining us, we've got Michael Aroni, who is the State Street Global Advisors U.S. Chief Investment Strategist. First and foremost here, when you look kind of broad strokes around the, the equity landscape right now, is there, is there anything that gets you, as Brian Sazi would say, hot and sexy at this point in time? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, listening to you and oh, Brian. Oh, you know it, Brian, Michael. Come on. You're feeling hot and sexy this morning. Come I'm on. Feeling, I'm always feeling hot and sexy, Brian. But listen, I think what's interesting here is that listening to both of you, I'm, I'm reluctant to pile on on the negativity. I'm looking for some silver linings here. Uh, one of the areas that we do like is energy. So energy continues to be supply constrained at a time when we're trying to make this transition from a fossil fuel space economy to something else. The stocks are cheap. They've demonstrated great capital discipline. They're returning both capital through dividends and buybacks uh, to shareholders. And you know, it looks like OPEC and its partners want to keep supply constrained and prices high. As a result, we think energy shares are kind of interesting at this point uh, of the cycle, and they've been reacting a little bit better of late from that from that standpoint. Yeah, I feel you, Michael. Uh, look, we had yesterday Exxon shares close at a record high. That is uh, catching a bit here in the pre-market, but. Let's stay on oil here. We, we have oil prices uh, climbing to near $100 a barrel. Doesn't that raise the risk of just wrecking this economy? I mean, we're slow growth here and, and really taking valuations down even further. I'm trying to understand how is oil at $100 a barrel a positive market catalyst into October? So I don't think it is a positive market catalyst. So on the one hand, I think it's great for energy companies, uh, energy services companies and the like, which is why we like it from an investment standpoint. So Brad saying, hey, Mike, are there any silver linings in the equity space? I think energy is one of those. But here's the thing, Brian, exactly as you're pointing out, I think that really has a negative impact on consumer spending potentially, on businesses in terms of business fixed investment. And I do think that that poses a challenge going forward for the economy. So it's interesting, as an equal weighted um, consumer discretionary sector has hit three-month relative lows, energy's hitting highs. I think there's some symmetry there. 
So what's good for energy stocks is probably not good for the consumer. And I would extend that to businesses. And you're seeing that reflected in some of the share prices of late. Uh, and I think that contributes to some of the concerns around the consumer. So that is one of the areas that I flagged. You guys were talking about it in terms of the consumer potential slowdown in spending is a risk to this market, is a risk to the economy going forward. Well, that said, Michael, in your notes to us, you say that the consumer discretionary sector remains attractive. Why is that, especially given what you're saying around how energy could be perhaps this, this overhang or this headwind? So I think this might take a little time to work out. There's a couple of things here. I think first and foremost, everybody, including the Federal Reserve, underestimated the positive impact that consumers and businesses are locked in at very low, late, low rates on their debt obligations, their mortgages and everything else. And now they can earn a competitive risk-free rate of return on money market-like instruments. This positive operating leverage, kind of to use that term, would suggest that this is having a much greater positive impact than anyone anticipated. And it could be the reason why higher interest rates haven't had the bite that they normally have. So Brad and Brian, I think this will take a little while longer to play out. And sure enough, here this morning, what is the market reacting to? Jobless claims continue to come in at incredibly low levels. So everyone who wants a job has a job. As long as that's, and companies aren't laying off workers, as long as that continues, I think the consumer will, will continue to be a positive for this market. It's just the rate of growth is going to slow as oil rates and, and inflation continue to bite. Fair point, Michael. Uh, you know, you mentioned that earnings estimates, uh, they are starting to come down. You think they're going to fall off a cliff. And I'm locking in on, on shares of CarMax today. Stock is getting absolutely obliterated, missed on earnings, terrible quarter, sales down double digits, warning about the impact of higher rates. Does Wall Street remain still too optimistic on the earnings power of S&P 500 companies? Just like we talked about the symmetry between consumer discretionary or the consumer and energy, I think there's some symmetry here as well. So if you think about what really fueled the rally in the first seven months of the year, it was this notion that analysts had ratcheted down their earnings expectations so much because they were anticipating a recession, more companies than normal beat them, and they beat them by a wider amount. Brian and Brad, I'm concerned that in the second half of the year, what's happened is the soft landing narrative has really taken hold. Analysts had become much more optimistic. So now I think we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. So when it comes to earnings, the levels don't matter as much. It's did you beat expectations or did you fail to beat expectations? And I'm concerned that expectations headed into the next two earnings seasons were too high. And as a result, we could be setting ourselves up for some disappointment. And here we are, Micron, as you mentioned, is a bit of a disappointment. So I do think that this is a risk going forward. Michael Aroni, State Street Global Advisors, U.S. Chief Investment Strategist. Always good to see you. Stay hot and sexy this weekend. We'll talk to you soon.